In today's episode, we're gonna make a rye bread that could have caused the Salem witch trials. I know, we'll explain. And we're gonna make the original Halloween treat, ancient druid soul cakes. Hey there, I'm Sola El Whaley, and this is Ancient Recipes with Sola. In each episode, we take a dish you may recognize and attempt to recreate one of the oldest versions of it to ever exist. So it's a little cooking, a little history, and a whole lot of me. What's not to love? It's almost Halloween. So, you know, I'm thinking about jack-o'-lanterns, candy corn, rye bread. Okay, maybe rye bread isn't the first thing that comes to mind when you think of costumes or trick-or-treating, but after this episode, it just might be. We're gonna pair that rye bread with ancient druid soul cakes that date back all the way to some of the earliest celebrations of Halloween, or Samhain, as it was called back then. Soul cakes are kind of like if a scone and a cookie had a spicy baby. They were originally baked to be gifts for the spirits of the dead. So let's get started on the rye bread, because witches. Okay, how does this bread tie into the Salem witch trials? Right around the same time as the Salem witch trials, there was an outbreak of the fungus ergot on the rye crops throughout the Northeast. This fungus, if eaten, has properties that can end up causing people to hallucinate. There is a theory that those hallucinations are what drove people mad and were thought to be people practicing witchcraft. But this is hotly debated, and there are many historians who disagree with this theory. It's a fascinating and intriguing hypothesis, though. And I have 100% verified stories to tell you along the way about this dark and fabled part of American history. Okay, so we're gonna start making the rye bread. First up, I need to cook some cornmeal. So I'm gonna grab this guy, and we're gonna preheat our skillet. Is there a trick to this? Whoa, cool. Let me get some water boiling. And we're gonna start this bread in a really unique way. We're gonna actually start it by making like a little porridge out of cornmeal. So here I've got dry flint corn. This is what the corn looks like before it's ground into cornmeal. If we really wanted to be like hardcore, we could gift smash all of this into this. But you know, we got cornmeal. So I'm gonna let this come up to a simmer. If you wanna make any kind of like polenta or porridge or anything like that, it's always good to get your water nice and hot. If you just dump the cornmeal into cold water, we're gonna have lumps. Clump city. So I've actually never made a bread that starts with cooked cornmeal, but I think it's gonna make it really moist, I imagine. There is this um, Japanese and Chinese technique where you start a bread by making a roux, so you cook some flour with some water, and then you knead that into the dough, and it makes the dough really moist and just last a really long time and not get stale. So I'm hoping that the addition of this cooked cornmeal is gonna give us the same vibe in our rye bread. So the hallucinations caused by the rye fungus are literally the same thing as LSD. Lysergic acid diethylamide is extracted from rye fungus, and the symptoms of someone who has ergotism, which is what happens when you have this fungus. It includes like creepy crawly sensations all over you, burning, swelling, hallucinations. I mean, I can see why they would think someone was like under a spell. It sounds like witchcraft, but it's nature. Okay, my water is bubbling. Now is the time to add your cornmeal. And we're gonna just cook this for a few minutes until we get like a thick porridge. And this is gonna be the base of our bread. That got really lumpy. I usually do this with a whisk. So the people in Salem, they actually switched to rye because they had a wheat crop failure. Wheat really struggles to grow in that cold weather in the Northeast. So the timing really lines up. Switching to rye and everyone goes crazy? I don't know, could have happened. This rye fungus thrives when it's grown in the lowlands during cold winters and wet springs, which is exactly the conditions that there were during the Salem Witch Trials. Okay, so you can see our mush really thickened up. At first, it might look like it might not because it wasn't that much corn to the water, but cornmeal really swells. If you've ever made polenta, you gotta start with like five cups of water for one cup of polenta. All of my cornmeal, is like hydrated, softened. We have kind of like a thick porridge. So I'm gonna go ahead and let this cool for a bit before we mix it into our bread dough. So my cornmeal mush has cooled down. We're gonna start mixing our bread. Here I've got some rye flour. We're not using the rye fungus, 
so I will not be going on an LSD trip today. But you know, we're gonna taste it. We're gonna get the vibe, right? I've actually never made a bread with all rye flour. Most rye breads use a combo of rye and wheat because rye alone doesn't really develop a lot of gluten and it ends up pretty dense. So there's like my kosher salt. I'm gonna fork whisk it in, evenly distribute. Like rye dough is a little, it's a little hard to work with. I feel like it's a little bit difficult to get that gluten going. It's very, very thirsty. You need a lot of water. It's gonna be a sticky dough, but it's not gonna be like a smooth, taut wheat bread. This is definitely a hearty, hearty bread. Okay, so flour whisked in. Next, instead of instant yeast, they did not have instant yeast back then. We're gonna use something called ale barm. We've used this before. This is like the scum that's on top after fermenting beer. And instant yeast is actually made by taking this stuff and drying it out and packaging it. So it's not that different. And we made this ourselves a couple days ago, let it get nice and bubbly. And now I'm gonna add my cornmeal mush. That's a bit warm. <laughs> I have like a really slow reaction time. Cornmeal mush. That's a bit warm. <laughs> I have like a really slow reaction time. I like fully picked it up. And I'm just gonna knead this in with some water. It's gonna be nice and sticky. And then we're gonna let this rise for about an hour before we divide it into loaves and then let it rise again. Now I'm gonna gradually add the water. I'm gonna kind of eyeball it, but I'm gonna get kind of get started here with the ale barm and the cornmeal. So I'm just slowly incorporating the dry into the wet, and we're gonna just keep adding a splash of water until we get a nice consistency. If you want this dough to be stickier than you think, because as it sits, it just like sucks it all up. So the Salem Witch Trial started in 1692 when several young girls claimed to be possessed by the devil, and they accused a few local women of being witches. You can see this already doesn't look anything like a wheat bread. It's almost like clay. I'm gonna activate a little help from Talmi. All right, here we go. It's just, you know, you need that leverage to get in there. Gotta make sure everything is nicely mixed. And then we're going to let this proof. By the spring of 1693, 100 people were imprisoned, 14 women and six men had been killed, and this was one of the last major witch trials to happen in the Western civilization. And it's a little bit unusual because prior to this witch trial, the last one was like in the 1500s, so it was pretty late. We were late to the game here. All right, so now this is super sticky. It's a lot like, it's almost like a clay. And we are going to let this rest for a bit before we divide this into two balls. I feel like this is gonna be a dense bread. Like I'm exhausted. I'm exhausted. This feels dense. Look at that. I'm, I'm actually really interested to taste this. I've never had a full rye bread. Interesting. Wow, it's like this would sink. This will definitely sink. Now I see why all rye bread's not a thing. I understand. We always, it's always like 25% rye. Because look at this, look at how heavy, look at how dense. It's crazy. It's a little bit sticky now, but as it rests, it's gonna suck all that up. Rye bread is just a sponge. Okay, so I'm gonna cover this up, set it aside to proof for about an hour, and then we're gonna get back at it. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> okay, so our bread has had some time to proof. Let's uh, divide these loaves. Thank you. Too much? No, I think you should keep it. I think it's good. All right, so this has had some time to rest and uh, it looks pretty much the same. No, it's less sticky. It's definitely absorbed some moisture. I'm gonna divide it in half and form two loaves, and we're gonna let it have some more time to rest and proof. I definitely smell that ale barm. It's coming through. Okay, I'm gonna make these round. 
So another and possibly more likely explanation for the Salem witch trials is mass hysteria and superstition. Probably a reflection of their strict religious beliefs and a justice system that valued repentance over truth. All right, I got one ball. Let's make another ball. And then these are gonna chill and we're gonna move on to our ancient druid soul cakes while these have a little bit more time to proof and relax and these are gonna be dense. I think that maybe they were so upset over in Salem because this is the bread they had. All right, so now we're gonna make our ancient druid soul cakes. We're gonna start like you would start a cookie. Actually, we're gonna start by creaming together some butter and honey. In the modern day soul cakes, people use sugar, but they wouldn't have had sugar way back then. So we're gonna use honey, and I think it's gonna give us a really tender cookie. Well, it's like, it's gonna, this is gonna be dense. It feels like this is gonna be dense. Once again, the theme of ancient recipes. All right, I'm adding the honey. So I wanna cream this until it's nice and light and fluffy. And I'm actually gonna cream this with our spices. So we're kind of taking a leap here with the spices. The Druids had a really special relationship with herbs, calling nine of them sacred even. Um, but we're not sure exactly what they would have used because they actually didn't write anything down. Everything we know about the Druids was written by the Romans. So we're using three that we knew were around when the Romans were around. We've got some saffron, rosemary, and cinnamon. And I'm gonna cream that together with our butter and honey. I think the mixing it all together with the butter is gonna really pull out the flavor from the saffron and the rosemary, so it's gonna like really evenly incorporate. All right, we're going in. All right. Smush. Butter is nicely tempered. Honey is warm under these lights. This is gonna cream together quickly. So trick-or-treating is said to come from the ancient Irish practice of mumming, or putting on costumes and going door to door singing songs to the dead the night leading up to the Samhain. Oh, and the soul cakes? They were given as payment to the ancient trick-or-treaters. Sound familiar? Okay, so now I've got my butter and honey and spices really nicely creamed together, and all there is to do is add the flour and some ale barm. Once again, there's ale barm, but I think that it's gonna add a little bit of leavening, maybe a little bit of lift, but mostly I think it's gonna add some flavor. And we're gonna mix this up into like a dense cookie batter. So how do soul cakes tie in to Halloween? Well, in Druid tradition, the Samhain was a festival of the dead celebrated on October 31st to mark the end of harvest and the beginning of winter. All right, so just in case you didn't know, a Druid is a high ranking member in ancient Celtic cultures. They acted as priests, teachers, doctors, important people. I'm gonna get in there with my hands to really make sure everything's mixed up. But we're looking close. And then we're gonna form these and put a little cross on top. Oh, and we're gonna add some currants. Folding in, folding in some currants. Boop. Okay, so this dough's come together nicely. Smells really good. Studded with these little currants. And we're gonna form them into little tiny cakes, you know? All right, so let me grab my baking sheet. We're gonna make these into, pull off like little balls, roll them, and we're gonna flatten them. So, you know, they're perfect size for your mummers when they come to town. Boom, just like that. Formation. Smush, formation, smush. Now we're gonna mark the cakes with a cross. And this is supposed to signify that these are alms or food given to the poor. I've seen some people who make a cross out of the currants on top. You could do that too. I like the idea of the currants being distributed within. I guess you could put them on top and within, go crazy. So early literature claims that Samhain was celebrated with big gatherings and feasts, and they actually opened up the burial mounds, which were seen as portals to the other world. They also had bonfires and sacrifices. That sounds like a good Halloween party. Samhain party. All right, I got all my crosses on. We're gonna brush this with a little bit of milk, 
and then it's going in the oven along with the rye bread, and then we're going to have our ancient Halloween party. Let's bake. It's time. It's finally time to taste our rye bread and soul cakes. And these guys, they're dense. They're really dense. So I'm really curious, concerned. I'm just gonna break it. Oh, wow. This is taking a lot of strength. I feel like, oh boy. Okay, all right. It's hearty in there, you know? There's no like big bubblage that you get from like an instant yeast fer fermentation. But uh, here we go, let's give it a shot. It feels, okay, it's dense, but it does feel a little bit moist, which I think maybe is because of the cornmeal. I don't know, I don't know. I'm gonna get in here. dense. It's definitely dense. It's really flavorful though. Like the rye flavor totally comes through. I don't really taste the corn, but you feel a little bit of the texture, which you really, really need because otherwise the rye flour alone, it almost eats a little bit mealy. So the little, little bit of grit you get from the cornmeal is nice. The flavor is fantastic, but this is like, this will sit in your belly. Like it is quite, quite dense, very heavy. Flavor's fantastic. I get why most of the time when you make rye bread, you cut it with a lot of wheat flour. If it was the, all there was to eat, I get it. It would fill you up. It would do the job. Okay, so now we finally get to taste our soul cakes. I'm really excited. From far away, I feel like it kind of looks like a Chips Ahoy cookie, right? The currants could be chocolate chips. So let's break into here. You smell the saffron. That's like the first thing that hits you. A lot of saffron. And I feel like saffron with honey, it's just like floral on floral, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. These are tasty. I'm really into this. The outside is really crisp. The inside, it is dense, but like a scone, because there's so much butter in there that it still eats really tender. I also, I really like the contrast from the pops of the chewy curds. Um, yeah, I think that the spice combo we went with really worked. The first thing I get is cinnamon. Cinnamon's aggressive. But then after that, the floral notes from the rosemary and the saffron really come through. I'm really like impressed with how much, how much saffron is really coming through. And that's what makes this feel really special. But does it compare to a fun size Snickers? I feel like this is something that the healthy house would pass out. You know? You know there's always that house that gives you apples and raisins? I bet they would also pass out soul cakes. But yeah, the soul cakes were pretty delicious. The rye bread was very interesting and I learned a lot of history. What kind of Halloween treats do you make? And do you think that soul cakes are gonna make your rotation for the trick-or-treaters? Let me know, let us know in the comments. If you like this episode, be sure to like and subscribe. And if there's any ancient or vintage recipe you think would be fun for me to try out, let us know in the comments and I'll see you next time.